Hi, good morning. good morning. I'm happy to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk a little bit today about amplified living, which is exactly about being big for God. Um, you know, it seems to me that uh, power, the power that we have within us, is really connected to this idea of faith. Um, faith in God, faith in our fellow man, faith in ourself, faith in the universe that we live in. I believe that the person who has lots of faith uh, in, in their own ability, in that presence and power of spirit within them, is able to just move through life and actually accomplish more. We accomplish more because we have greater faith. So those who have great faith, I think, actually have great power. So it seems to me that on earth, people who have had great power were people who had great faith in something greater than themselves. So if we go back to the ancient Greeks in uh, uh, ancient... Uh, Greece, there was a fellow Euripides who said, I have found power in the mysteries of thought. So we're going back thousands of years, and even back then, people knew that our thought had something to do with it. And Ernest Holmes said it like this, the founder of our church, he said, there is limitless power at our disposal. To learn how to think is to learn how to live. So what if we accepted God's offer for us, which I believe is being offered to us all the time, and we said yes to life in an enormous way? I mean, if we just really opened up our heart and our mind and we said yes to the life that God is offering to us all of the time, what if we experience this, what I'm calling today, amplified living? I believe that is what God intends for each and every one of us, because none of us were born to struggle. None of us were born to just get by or just feel like, you know, something's missing. Everybody else got the manual, but I didn't. Nobody was born for that experience. Some people, I think, put a lot of care and energy on, you know, the, uh, exercising their bodies, which, well, that's a fine thing to do. And some people are very concerned about what they clothe their body, and that's a fine thing too. I'm in favor of anything that helps you feel good about yourself and doesn't hurt anybody else. That's my baseline. If it helps you feel good about yourself and doesn't hurt anybody, yes, go for that. You know, sometimes people um, see other people who are in, like, physical condition, physical condition that they admire, and they say, wow, that's, that's how I want to be. I want to be that fit. I want to be that healthy. But if the thing is, for any of these things, I believe they're all achievable for each and every one of us if we are willing to put in the time and the effort to achieve those results. Now, you know, again, I, have, I, there's no, I don't have any judgment on whatever it is that makes you feel good. I think the, the, the karmic line is, as long as I am not infringing on anybody else's free will, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, you know, then I think God, the universe, love supports it. But where are the people whose focus is so centered on their soul, on their own spiritual growth? See, it's easy to be focused on, I want to be in shape, or I want to look a certain way, I want to have a certain job. But what about the quality of my own individual soul? When, when we look at those people's lives, we say, wow, that's what a life could really, really be like. Ernest Holmes, again, our founder, said, the invisible is more powerful than the visible. Think about that. So what we don't see, we teach is more powerful than what we actually do see. Now, there are probably many, many people in this room who have touched something that may be so powerful in their lives, right? And what we do with that is that we have a yearning that will not leave us once we've touched that. Once we have had a greater experience of God, a greater experience of love, a greater experience of that spiritual essence, you know, I think there's something within us that says, I want more of that. I want to experience that again. I want to carry that experience with me all of the time. You know, the, that, that energy, you know, the energy and the time and the focus we bring to our lives is so we can sense this is what our lives can be like. This is what our soul can evolve into if I will just give this some of my regular and best attention. See, because this experience is what is offered to us by God all the time, I believe, that God is always saying, you can have a bigger life. Your life can be better. Your life can be healthy. Your life can be filled with more love. See, you know, we, we've had messengers on, uh, on earth who have lived this life much more fully. And so let me say something about Jesus, that Jesus lived in a state, I believe, of amplified living. We would call it Christ consciousness in the science of mind. You know, uh, 
in the gospel, it says, you know, I, what we see again and again is this idea where Jesus says, I, I'm not the great exception to the rule. See, that in New Thought, we see that Jesus was the great example of what is meant for us, of what's potential within us, of what we ourselves may become. We could rise to that level of consciousness. If we really knew how connected we were to the infinite, if we really knew our oneness with God, we could rise closer to these places that the other spiritual masters who've been on earth before us have uh, arrived at. So I'm asking all of us to pick one area of your life today where you are willing to give God, spirit, the infinite, a little more sway, a little more room. You know, because I suspect if you're like me, and I think we are similar in this way, that we all have areas where we say, you know, I'm not going to really give this area to God because I don't think God would really understand this. So I'm going to continue to handle this area myself. I'm going to play this really close to the vest here. I'll invite God into these other areas of my life. But this area, I don't really think that God, for example, I don't really think that God understands relationship. Or I don't, you know, God doesn't really get what it's like to date in 2020. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, or God doesn't really understand uh, finances, you know, so I've got, to, I've got to do this more my way. But, you know, what I always find is those areas where we finally, finally get to that place where we surrender and we just say, all right, God, I'm open. I'm open. I'm willing. I've only gotten so far with my knowledge. Now I'm open to the infinite. Those areas where we do that, I find that those areas just work so much better. Right? Because we teach in the science of mind that God is a God of love who desires only good for us. You know, then, then what we do is say, okay, God desires only good for me. I can let go and I can let God. See, because without, without the consciousness of faith, a consciousness of trust, and a consciousness of belief, we cannot let go and let God because we don't trust what we're letting go and letting, letting into. Right? If I think that God does not desire only good for me, then I'm going to be a little reticent about letting go of a particular area of my life. Or I'm going to be particularly reticent about saying, you know, God, come into this area fully. You know, I've talked a lot about unleashing the potential that's within us. And all of the potential that ever exists within you, within me, exists right now. So the capacity for us to live a bigger, more amplified life in what we're calling Christ consciousness is within us. But we have to match that capacity with our willingness. You know, it's not just that it's going to happen. I have to be willing. You know, the way God gives to us, we teach in the science of mind, is that God is always giving us ideas. You know, and maybe we throw some of these ideas out the window. We just say no. You know, and then maybe some of them we consider a little more seriously. But that's the way God gives to us. We teach that God is always giving to us through the realm of ideas. Um, now, it may be that we think some of these ideas are just too big, you know? It may be that we think we're not big enough for the idea, but the idea is beyond what I'm used to. You know, it's too big for the life I know. But God loves each of us so much that he doesn't leave us alone. You know, he keeps sending our ideas our way. Have you noticed that? That the ideas just keep coming and coming and coming, that the infinite just gives us infinite ideas. And according to our willingness, we can accept and receive greater blessings into our life or just say, no, 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 I'm not ready. I'll wait for my life to get better. I will wait for the blessings. You know, in Science of Mind, we teach that there's one presence, one power, right? Where, and where that power is, is everywhere, and that includes right where we are. That power, that presence of spirit exists, and it exists within us. So we must sort of unlock that power or unleash the power that within us. It's, you know, that power is not us. It's not a personal power. It's the power, it's the presence, it's the activity of God individualized as us. You know, I, I don't really like it in metaphysics when people go around saying, I'm God, I'm God, and I think, really? You're God? Really? I mean, it's like, you have something to do with the earth spinning all the time or that planets, uh, uh, planets revolve around the sun, babies turn into embryo, uh, embryos turn into babies and seeds, and you have something to do with that? No, absolutely not. But the power that does all of those things is the same power that's within us. We have access to that level of intelligence and power and creativity. I, I, think that, I think that's just thrilling. I love that. But, you know, so one of the ways we could say it is that, you know, all that I am is part of God. I'm not all that God is. 
right? So, but, but all that I am, all that you are, is part of God. And so this power that I'm talking about, you know, when I say that, it's like, you know, it's not that I heal people or you heal people. We allow the power that's greater than we are to work through us so that healing can happen. You know, we, we, we look at this infinite power and we say, okay, this infinite power is within my thinking. And I want this power that's within my thinking, that's within my being, to move into every area of my life. And so in a very, very human sense, I think faith is the name of this power. And how we use this power, how we use our faith, well, that's absolutely up to us. But faith is the power we direct how through our thinking. You know, no one, no one has more faith ability than you or I. Right? I mean, really, there, we think, well, some people seem to have a lot more faith in me. No, no, absolutely not. It's just, what do we have faith in? I mean, some days, some days are good, and it's really easy to have faith in love and the goodness of humanity and the light that's in the world. Other days, not so good, you know? And so maybe we put more of our faith in the darkness or things not working out or that things are difficult. But you know, you were created, each and every one of us are created in the image and likeness of God. And so I believe that, that what that means, what that has to do with, is that we have free will, that we have choice, we have a creative capacity, we have dominion over our life in a greater way than we have given ourselves credit for. So how you, how we demonstrate it is absolutely up to us. I believe we have within us right now everything we need, you know, that we were created with it. You know, in India, they, they, um, elephants are work animals in India, or, or they certainly have been for a very long time. Uh, they're really sort of this beast of burden. And the way they train them is by tethering one of the elephant's legs with a chain to a tree. Right? So everybody gets that there. Here's an elephant with a chain from one leg to the tree. And then over time, like maybe after a month or so, they replace that chain with the rope. Now, the elephant could actually break the rope very easily. But because he's been trained with a chain, he says, oh, there's a limitation there, right? There's a limitation there. So we might be like the elephant, trained to believe that that limitation is there. But that, has no more, that limitation actually has no more power than the power and the belief that we put into it. You know, a, a, belief, a belief cannot contain or limit us unless we believe it does. So if I think I'm limited in an area it's, it's not true, it's just my belief. And so I would ask you today to think about what area of life do you see yourself as limited in? See, I need to find a way to think at a different level. You know, like, what if the word among the elephants was never give up, you know? What if the elephants said to each other, hey, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, right? And so very, very, at some point, one of those elephants is going to break the rope. And I'm certain because all minds are connected, once that first elephant does, they're all going to break the rope, right? Well, I think, I think that that's like us. So over 50 years ago, 60 years ago in Thailand, there was a statue of a Buddha that was discovered. You know, and so what had happened is several hundred years ago, uh, there was an invasion. And the people of the community gathered together, and they melted down all of the gold that they had, and they made this great Buddha. And then they covered the Buddha with clay, and they fired the Buddha. So it just looked like a big clay Buddha. And what they did is they put it on a raft, and they sent it down the river. And uh, during the invasion, all of these people in these villages were killed. So later, the Buddha statue was found. And for many years, it was kept in Bangkok. Right? Um, and uh, they were building a new temple, and, and one of the, old, the older priests said, well, this, this old Buddha is very special. We should keep it. Can it be brought into the new temple? While they were moving the temple, it slipped off the cart or the pallet, and it was cracked. And the next day, the sun came up, and just where the sun came up hitting the statue, this beautiful golden light beamed out of the statue. It, what they discovered was there was a gold statue inside of the clay statue, and it had been hidden there for hundreds of years. This did not look like a particularly auspicious statue of the Buddha, right? Because why? Because nobody could see it, you know? So they, they had very little respect for this Buddha, and yet this Buddha that they had very little respect for contained all of the gold. So I think that's, that's kind of like us, isn't it? The God, the good, the gold is in us. And we are surrounded by our own 
thinking, some of which is aligned with truth, some of it is not. Everybody has some level of misperception. Everybody has some level of personality. Every, you know, we all have our own stuff right? about who we think we are and what we think we can attain or what we can achieve. You know, and because of that, we get confused and we think that that's who we are. We think that the clay is who we are when all along the great gift, the presence of God, exists within us. This is why we have to have greater faith in ourselves and what we are able to do and what we are connected to. See, because I believe God will lead us through the, uh, the fulfillment of whatever our dream is if we are willing to let God dream the dream by means of us. And what I mean by that is that if we are willing to say, all right, I'm open, God, you let me know what to do and I'll follow. You know, you give me the next step and I'll take it. Mm -hmm. You know, Walt Disney went bankrupt three times. Isn't that extraordinary? I don't know. If I went bankrupt three times, I think I'd kind of give up. I don't know about you, but, but he was driven. You know, the ideas that he had would not leave him alone. And his big thing was he wanted to produce animation movies, but he had no money. He was bankrupt. But the dream would not leave him. And so he wanted to make Snow White. Mm -hmm. Yes, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And in the 30s, he was able to gather several million dollars. I imagine today that would be like billions of dollars, right? And so he put a lot of belief and enthusiasm into this to get other people to lend their dollars to that dream. And he was able to do that because of his unwillingness, his unwillingness to give up on his dream. And so before it was over, Disney spent more money on creating Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs than they spent on Gone with the Wind and the Wizard of Oz together, all right? Because they had to invent equipment, they had to invent machinery. He had a, an enormous, enormous staff. It took over four years to complete. Now it's history, of course. You know, if not for Snow White, there would be no Pinocchio, Bambi, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Lion King, Disneyland, on and on and on, right? But he didn't know about Disneyland early on. He was just following the dream that was in front of him at that particular time. Right? So this is why we say all the time, you know, what's the next right thing to do? What's the next right thing to do? And if I follow that, more will be revealed. You know, we don't know what great good God will bring forth if we listen and follow the dream that is in front of us right now. So I ask you again to think about what area of your life are you willing to let God work in in a greater way? A woman said to me recently, I'm going to go back to school and get my master's degree. She said, well, and I said, oh, I think that's wonderful. She says, yeah, but you know, I'm going to be in my 60s by the time I get my master's degree. And I said, well, you're going to be in your 60s anyway. <laughs> right? She kind of looked at me, and I said, well, so why not be in your 60s and get a master's degree? If you're going to be in your 60s, if you're going to hang around on Earth, you know, if, if this is what calls you, if this is what pulls to you, why not, why not go there? See, everybody, you have power right now at your disposal, and that power is faith, right? How you use it, you know, is up to you, and a way to use it intelligently is to focus, right? Focus is the laser that moves the power. Focus with faith is, is moving toward our dream. Mm -hmm. so, so back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you know, I, you know so here's an idea, right? And, and we might say, well, but I don't have the money, or I don't know how. No one will let me. You know, there's no machinery to make such a thing. On and on and on. But Walt Disney, he held the dream, and money came, and know-how came, and people came, and machinery was built. You know, ideas come because ideas are God's currency. You know, if we will focus, we will be told how. You know, our job is just to know the what. The how exists in the infinite mind always. So, you know, I've always loved this quote by George Bernard Shaw. He said, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. He said, I don't believe in circumstances. He said, the people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. They make them. So I'll share one more story with you that, that I just love. And this is about Rossini, the composer, that he wrote The Barber of Seville, the opera, which I'm sure many of you know or have at least heard about. And when he first wrote The Barber of Seville, it was a fiasco. Um, people were looking for Rossini everywhere. 
You know, and, and singers were saying, oh, he must have committed suicide. That went so badly. They actually looked in the river for his body. <laughs> Where they found him was he was in bed asleep. Yeah, after the opening that was so horrible, Rossini just went to bed. He just went to bed. And they said, well, evidently the barber is not good enough. He said, so, so I want to compose something better. That's all. And he went back to sleep. And they're like, what? And so the barber was not yet the great success that he knew it could be. And so he wrote, rewrote and rewrote and rewrote and he rebuilt and was unwilling to give up. And he focused on this dream that was like a dream that was dreaming him. See, and so ultimately he came up with a fantastic version that is now the version that people love. Right? So we have faith. Ever, all of us, we have faith in something right now. Hmm? What do we want to do with that? Do we want to use our faith to limit us, or do we want to use our faith to grow our experience of life? You know, so right now, right now, this is the faith in you and the faith that's in me. And we get to decide. We get to sprinkle a little of our dominion into that faith and see what it does. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment and just remind ourselves that right here where we are, we are filled with the allness, the goodness, the infinite nature of God. God's infinite spirit dwells within us. And we are all connected on the unseen side of life. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for each and every one of us that we are being big for God that we are experiencing amplified living, that there is a greater yet to be within the heart and soul of each and every one of us, and it's God seeking a fuller and greater expression of itself, and we say yes to that today. We allow God to be God by means of us more so than we have ever done thus far. And I know, I know for each and every one of us that wonderful healing is taking place in some area, in any area, in every area of our life. We are open. So we include in our prayer our parents and children, our family members, and those we hold near and dear. And we remind ourselves that they are surrounded and filled with God's infinite presence. God's intelligence fills their mind and guides their actions. And that all things are working out for their highest and greatest good. We let our prayer be a blessing energy that surrounds the entire globe, touching every person, every life, every being. And we let this prayer be a prayer of love and healing and conscious upliftment so that all people everywhere are blessed and raised up. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. Because truly, on the unseen side of life, we are all connected. There's only one. We're all it. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth right here, right now. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.